Okay, good morning. Um, so I'm really, uh, I, I'm actually uh, delighted that we're having a, a meeting about the, the, uh, the very rich, uh, the, which is, uh, um, it, it's a subject which until very recently, and even to some extent now, has been kind of hard to broach, at least in, in my circles. Uh, there's been this sort of sense that, that when we talk about inequality, we should be talking about the top quintile, or we should be talking maybe about the top 5%, or even about the top 1%. It took a long time before we could get people to do that. And um, uh, the, uh, we just had our big workshop at the Stone Center, at the Graduate Center on inequality by the numbers, and one of the students was asking, uh, why do we talk about the one percent? That's not actually, you know, that's not that that doesn't actually that that, that, that that's like four hundred thousand a year. That's not the uh, that's not the plutocrats we we envision. And it, you know, there are historical reasons why it came to be that. But um, but there's there's still a, I think a, a sense. First of all, that there's something kind of prurient about talking about extreme wealth. That it's uh, that it's it's uh, that that there's a, it's an issue of envy or it's an issue of uh, just plain you know lifestyles of the rich and famous or something like that, um, and also a broad failure on the part I believe of many people to understand just how much money we are talking about. Uh, we had an event a couple months ago um, at the Graduate Center where Janet Gornick, director of the Stone Center, a longtime director of Luxembourg Income Study, just mentioned in passing that the average income of the top 25 hedge fund managers was about 800 million. Uh, and uh, people in the audience said, no, that's wrong, they, they, that can't be right. They had no idea, and it, no, no it's, it's right. That, that, is, that's not, that is a genuine number, there really is that much money at the top. Um, why do we care? So the, the, there, there, are, you know, there, there are multiple issues, there are, if we're talking about who might be asked to pay somewhat higher taxes to pay for expanded uh, social uh, uh, safety net programs of various kinds, investments in children and so on, uh, you probably are going to be talking about taxes that are a little bit beyond the 1%, something like the, uh, the, the taxes that pay for Obamacare, which really hit uh, around 2% of the population. Um, if you're talking about, uh, uh, you know, people who are in one way or another uh, insulated from many of the concerns that face uh, the typical American family, uh, you're already in that range at the 1%. But there are uh, some really important issues where a much smaller group uh, plays a critical role. And, a, and as, as I think every speaker is probably going to argue, a, 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 a distorting role in our society. Some of those are more diffuse. Uh, there are, I believe, I would argue, though without being able to quantify it, that there are uh, social costs, that there are damages to our sense of ourselves as a society uh, from having uh, people who are just completely in a different material universe from the rest of the population. Um, but what I want to focus on uh, for this morning's remarks um, are the political implications of having people with uh, a, with a, a very, very large amount of money um, and a very small group of people. Um, some of you may know, I, I thought I would jot down a few notes for this talk uh, over the weekend and somehow found myself jotting down more and more notes and ended up just posting it as an 1800 word blog post on, at the time. So, uh, so a lot of what I'm, uh, I'm about to say has already been previewed. Um, but, but I think I do want to come back to it. So, um, so we, there's a group, and we don't need to define it too exactly. Maybe it's the 0.01%, which is, a, is really what people have in mind when they, often when they use the phrase the 1%. It's really, it's really a much smaller group. Um, this is a group uh, that is, um, it's elusive. Uh, and I know that Heather is going to talk some numbers, and we do have, we have, you know, the best estimates we can do of, of how much money this group has, but it's actually pretty hard to do. It's, the, the, you know, normal survey methods are obviously not going to pick up, uh, pick up the, uh, the income and wealth of that group. Uh, the, um, we've tended to use uh, administrative data, basically tax re uh, returns, uh, but what, what we've been learning recently owing to the work of people like Gabriel Zuckman is that there's you know, tax avoidance and uh, evasion, uh, which, which 
the, the difference is one of legality, but in terms of the implications, not that different, um, that, that tax avoidance is a really big deal at the top, that, uh, that we really have uh, only a, a, a very imperfect notion of how much money there is there. Um, it's also an elusive group in terms of its role in the political system. Uh, I've been, I'm an avid consumer of quantitative political science. And there have been uh, th several recent studies, particularly there's a new, relatively new book by, by Paige C. Wright uh, uh, called Billionaires and Stealth Politics, uh, which talked about how, in fact, uh, great wealth is deployed um, in, in, uh, on, on behalf of political uh, decisions. Uh, and uh, groups like the, the billionaires who just said, please tax us, uh, are what you hear about. And it's great that they do this. Uh, they're also extremely exceptional. Uh, and what you have by and large is billionaires spending large sums of money uh, to promote their own self-interest uh, in ways that are mostly below the radar, are really quite hard to track. Um, this gives this very small group of people a lot of power. We have a uh, formally democratic one-person, one-vote system. Um, in practice, uh, dollars talk quite loudly. Uh, the reasons they do are themselves a little bit elusive. Uh, there's, a, I think if you asked even me five years ago uh, how much raw corruption, just plain bribery there is in this system, I would have said, well, that's probably not a big deal. And actually, I don't think that anymore. Uh, there's probably a whole lot more of that than we think there is. Um, there's a lot of uh, soft corruption. Uh, we, People may not even quite admit to themselves that it's corrupt, but the, the revolving door, uh, appointments at, at uh, think tanks, uh, the um, um, speaking circuit, uh, it's, a, it's a lot more, certainly at the worlds I know, it's, it, the, the opportunities for supplemental income if you are a conservative uh, uh, finance professor are a lot bigger. Uh, than if you are a professor who's a radical cri uh, critic of, uh, of Wall Street. Um, um, there's campaign contributions, which we talk about a lot, which are definitely a big deal, although I think maybe less of a big deal than we, we think, uh, if, if only because at this point there's so much money floating around in politics that, that we're, it probably runs into diminishing returns at, at some point. Um, but the thing that that really motivated me uh, as I started to think about was the extent to which um, the very wealthy get to define the agenda, get to define the, the, the boundaries to the, uh, the Overton window, if you like, the notions of what is, what is considered uh, to be a responsible, sensible policy. What things do you need to worry about how do we pay for and which things do you not? Which things are considered to be sound, responsible policy and which things are not? And that's, a, that's been, uh, uh, I'll talk about a, a specific instance um, in, in, in a minute, but that's been a really big deal in, um, in, uh, on multiple fronts. Um, and as you might expect, the kinds of things that the 0.01% on average thinks are uh, priorities are different from those that are priorities for most people. Uh, and some of those are enduring things. Um, uh, investments in public goods. Uh, it depends a little bit on what the public goods are, but if we're asking about things like uh, investments in public education, uh, well, we're talking about a group of people who, who don't use public education, so they're not going to be very uh, for it. We're talking about things like investments in childhood nutrition uh, and child care. Uh, well, their children are not going to be underfed, and uh, uh, they're going to have health care, and they have nannies. Um, it, we're talking about uh, certain kinds of infrastructure. Uh, well, some things are going to be invested in, uh, air traffic control probably, uh, but uh, maybe other things not so much. Uh, so uh, subways uh, are probably not, uh, uh, bus service are, are not going to be uh, top priorities. Um, what we, um, uh, when it comes to the more bigger 
uh, macro issues, what we've learned, thanks to uh, things, some things I think we suspected, but but are, are now much more confirmed, is that there are huge differences in uh, priorities, perceptions uh, between the the uh, small wealthy minority and the population at large. Um, the uh, I, I'm now seeing in the last four days, I think four different articles that, that used uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, so yes, the rich, the very rich are different from you and me. Um, you see that very clearly on a, on a couple of, of big issues. Um, one of them is, um, is taxes. Um, the uh, polling is overwhelmingly, the, uh, overwhelmingly says that, that people believe that the rich don't pay enough in taxes and that taxes on top incomes and corporations should go up. And yet, an enduring piece of the political agenda has been to cut top tax rates. Uh, when when, uh, when Bowles Simpson produced their initial uh, draft uh, PowerPoint, um, cutting marginal tax rates was right at the top of the agenda. And what was that doing in a, in a document that was allegedly about fiscal responsibility? Um, the, um, and social safety net. The public wants to spend more on social security and on health care. Um, but we've, we know from these very difficult to conduct but illuminating surveys that the, the 0.01% uh, is, um, wants to uh, cut taxes at the top, not surprisingly, and wants to cut spending on entitlement programs, uh, uh, diametrically opposed to public opinion at large. Um, all of this, the, what, what you see, of course, is that uh, to a remarkable extent, the policy agenda set in Washington reflects the preferences not of the general public, but of this very small wealthy minority. And sometimes that has extremely, not just it's kind of unfair consequences, but e extremely deleterious consequences uh, for the conduct of, uh, of economic policy. So the, um, uh, the case in point that where some of my thing interests come together with all of this um, uh, is starting to get a little old, but I think is still relevant, uh, which was how did we deal with the aftermath of the great financial crisis? How did we, uh, uh, we, we had a, uh, a, a, uh, a severe, a, a really a, a 1931 level crisis in the financial system in 2008. We had a recession which was um, not full Great Depression level, uh, but was extremely severe. And actually, uh, the reason it wasn't full depression level had a lot to do with, with uh, automatic stabilizers. Uh, big government saved us from a full replay of, of, the, of the 1930s. Um, but then, um, and for the first few months, we had a more or less, uh, a, a response that was at least in the right direction, fiscal stimulus, monetary easing. Then a weird thing happened, and it happened in 2010, 2011, which was somehow the agenda changed. Somehow, even though unemployment was still above 9%, uh, everyone inside the Beltway uh, was talking about the great threat posed by budget deficits and the urgency of entitlement reform. Uh, and this was not, I'd like to say it was a debate, but it didn't even feel like a debate. It felt, uh, and it was, you can, you can actually document this, to a remarkable extent, both the political establishment and the, uh, and the media simply stated as facts that this was what had to be done. So there, are, there, was, a, uh, there was a great article uh, by Ezra Klein at the time about the trouble with Alan Simpson, uh, where he quoted various reporters who would ask uh, so will President Obama do the right thing? Uh, these were not opinion writers. These were supposedly reporters. And the right thing meant uh, cutting Social Security and Medicare. Uh, it simply became defined as this was the responsible, the right thing to do. Um, the, so what happened? Um, uh, what happened very clearly was uh, that, oh, I'm sorry, and I, I should say that and it was also very clear that this was not the right thing. 
Uh, if, there was, if there was one, uh, I mean, the, the, the peculiar thing about the aftermath, uh, you know, nobody really saw the financial crisis coming except for, except for people who uh, saw five other crises coming that didn't happen, right? Uh, um, but once it happened, uh, the, we all understood. Uh, we, you know, people I talked to, we, we understood what had happened. It, uh, we, uh, we, you know, we understood what, what we'd missed. We hadn't, hadn't quite realized just how much havoc the bursting housing bubble would wreak. We hadn't realized how much shadow banking had restored uh, old-fashioned financial instability. Um, people, I don't know how many economists, you know, you know, people I know were sort of wandering the halls, muttering, diamond divvick, diamond divvick. Uh, but anyway, um, the, um, so, but, and we knew what to do. This was actually we have very clear textbook economics. You cut interest rates as far as you can, uh, but you need fiscal stimulus to take up the slack because the private sector wasn't going to be willing to spend enough even, even at zero interest rates. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the remedy, the way to avoid having an, an extended period of high unemployment was utterly clear um, and was rejected. We had a, all around the Western world, we had a turn towards austerity that was economically destructive, uh, clearly prolonged. We, we should have been back to full employment by 2012 or something. Uh, we could have been quite easily. In fact, in fact, it, it went on much, much longer than that. Um, and the funny thing was, again, as I say, that there was, this was not treated as debate. Doing the, the wrong thing was the right thing. It was, uh, it was simply assumed to be the case that this was what we should be doing. And what had happened, I, I have to admit, I don't think I fully appreciated it at the time. What had happened was that a lot of the uh, uh, political and media establishment simply internalized the values of the 0.01%. That the, the kinds of policy views that come naturally to people of great wealth um, were just defined the parameters of what was considered responsible. The responsible thing to do was what the typical billionaire, as opposed to the atypical people who, who are supporting what we're doing at this conference, um, tends to think should be done. Uh, why, um, why that particular uh, point of view, why that outlook? Um, a lot of it is uh, narrow self-interest. Uh, or at, at least some kind of class interest. You don't have to be a vulgar Marxist to say that, uh, that it's, it's kind of understandable that somebody with a, a, a great deal of money should, should support lower tax rates on high incomes and, and uh, low tax rates on inherited wealth. Um, it's not hard to understand really why they should support uh, cuts in entitlement programs um, because the entitlement programs require taxes to support them and and in the end uh, that's you know the, the ev even in the US the tax and transfer state even though the US has the weakest welfare state in the OECD uh, it's still considerably redistributive so this is it was natural for them to oppose this I think there's also just that there is a a, uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, lack of, of identification it, there there are two there are two, I think, great gaps in perception in our, in our, uh, in our society right now. Um, on the one hand, um, most people have no idea how rich the rich are. I already mentioned that. Uh, people just have no notion. They, they, you, it's the constant. I've spent, I think, 15 years dealing with people who say, well, you say that, that there's a problem with the rich, but you know, shouldn't sports stars be paid a lot of money? Shouldn't music stars be they are not paid a lot of money by the standards of Wall Street. It's, it's, uh, it, it, people have no idea just how high the incomes are at the top. Um, and on the other hand, I think that being at the top means that you have a very little sense of what life is like for most people. Uh, uh, the classic example being the constant say, demand that we raise the retirement age. Because after all, people are living longer, so shouldn't, shouldn't Social Security be delayed? And the answer is, well, actually, higher income people are living longer. Uh, there's a growing gap in life expectancy um, based upon socioeconomic status. And the bottom half of the, uh, of, of the income distribution 
um, who are exactly the people who depend on Social Security most, have seen hardly any rise in life expectancy at all. In fact, at this point in the last few years, declining life expectancy. Uh, so this is a complete, you know, basically we're saying that because, because uh, um, uh, highly paid uh, 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 accountants are living longer, uh, that janitors should have their, uh, their retirement, uh, should, should lose their, 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 their retirement. And it's a, um, um, and I, I, as far as I can make out, there's an honest, I mean, one of the, one of the things that does come with great wealth is, uh, in most cases, not all, is, is an insulation of the reality, from the realities of life. Uh, I suspect that very few people in the 0.01% realize that for the majority of Americans, Social Security is uh, the dominant and in many cases the sole source of support in retirement. And so, demands that it be cut. Um, all of this means that it matters a lot that this group has acquired so much power, that, that the concentration of income and wealth at the top um, has distorted our, our society, has led us to make bad choices uh, uh, in just in terms of the, of the overall state of the economy, as well as unjust choices, choices that, that hurt uh, ordinary people, uh, a, even if they may benefit a few people at the top. Um, and we need to try to turn this around. Um, and uh, maybe mes the most important thing um, is that we still have this tendency to assume that because people have made a lot of money or inherited a lot of money, but anyway, what, because people have a lot of money, that that means that they actually uh, understand the world. That, they, that, that, that being rich means that you are also wise. And that is very, very much not true. In fact, it's, uh, I don't want to romanticize the wisdom of the common man, but the, uh, but the fact of the matter is that, that if anything, the, uh, the top 0.01% uh, has a worse idea about the realities of life and the, and the, the real impacts of policy than, than ordinary voters. Uh, and anything we can do to curb that influence is going to help make America a better place. Thanks. Oh, good question. Thank you so much, Paul. That was wonderful, as always. Uh, we do have time for a couple of questions. There will be microphones uh, circulating in the audience. Please do say your name and keep your question nice and short so we can get a couple in. Thanks. The Institute for Policy Studies, thanks for that. When you made your comment about um, people being clueless in the social security debate, I re was reminded of Larry Fink from Blackstone who said that we should raise the retirement age because people mostly just sit around in their jobs now anyway, so they can work longer. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to ask, you've written some really insightful columns about other economic models in other parts of the world, and Denmark, for example. I wonder if there's anything we can learn about how some other countries have dealt with their 0.1%. Okay, so um, I mean the Nordics are, are a really interesting case, uh, and it, so it's just just this morning that the, the Post has something about how uh, Democrats are wrong, the Nordics are not socialist. Which no, you know, who who said they were? Uh, they're social democratic. Um, uh, they are a you know living refutation of the orthodoxies of uh, you know the uh, uh, saying that that uh, that that high taxes are enormously destructive may get you a presidential medal of freedom, uh, but it doesn't, uh, but, but just look at Denmark. Just look at Sweden. These are countries that are, uh, have tax, uh, far higher taxes than we do. Uh, and yet they have, uh, you know, in terms of outcomes, things like prime age employment rates, they do better than we do. Um, what is true about the 0.01%, the, um, even the Nordics are not that successful at, uh, at taxing extreme wealth. Uh, they, they, they make more of an effort at it than we do, uh, but they do live in a globalized world. Uh, and what we've learned, actually a lot of it, I hope if, if people follow this stuff, Gabriel Zuckman's been doing this amazing stuff on, on tax havens. Uh, and a lot of the data, there's, there's this kind of, uh, as I said, the, the rich are elusive. We, we actually uh, uh, know as much as we do, which is not as much as we should, only here thanks to the accident of the Panama Papers, 
Um, and then the Panama Papers integrated, what Gabriel did was he integrated it with, with information provided by the, uh, the Swedish Ministry of Finance, which was willing to supply enough data so that he could do matching. Um, so that's on the one hand saying that the Swedes clearly have a very different attitude towards this. They are, they are actually willing to say that high concentration of wealth is a bad thing. But it also, what it turns up is that there's an awful lot of offshore hidden wealth on the part of Scandinavians. So there are, there are it, it's not, the Scandinavian 0.01% is also parking a lot of money in, in, uh, in, in offshore tax havens. Um, so it is hard. However, uh, uh, Denmark used to have a wealth tax. Uh, it's complicated politics about, and it was effective. They did manage to collect money. It's actually a, a key part of the, of the background behind the Warren tax proposal is that in the, the few cases w where wealth taxes have been applied, uh, there was less evasion than you might have, have feared. Uh, so, um, not a perfect answer. The, uh, the, it's probably true that there's been a, a plutocratic trend even in Sweden and Denmark. Uh, but it's nothing like as bad as it is here. And then, you know, we should also talk about our own history. I mean, the, the, what, uh, what the New Deal did, it's funny, we're, you know, we're all talking about New Deal now, and, and is Bernie Sanders the, the true inheritor of the New Deal as a rule of war? Never mind. The, uh, but, the, uh, but the reduction in concentration of income at the top was very dramatic. And uh, the, the, there's a... Uh, there's an old Fortune article from 1955 about how executives live now in 1955, which says you know, they're vastly poorer than they were in, in the 30s. And it's fine, they're happy, they have good lives, and they work as hard as ever. And, uh, um, so we should, so his, history says that, that you don't, we don't have to have the society we have now. Other questions? Chuck, there you got a couple over there. I'm enough of a nerd to enjoy digging data out of the Zuckman Sayas database. Yeah. And when I do, I see two very different chapters in American history from 1945 to 1981. I see a chapter of prosperity capitalism where incomes yeah. rose for the entire workforce. And from 1981 forward, I see a chapter I would call I would call enrichment capitalism. Yeah. I wonder if that contrast between prosperity capitalism up to Reagan and enrichment capitalism from Reagan forward has caught other people's attention too. Oh, yeah, people like me have been talking about that for, for decades, literally. Uh, the, uh, uh, that, uh, the, um, I had a 1992 article in the, in the American Prospect uh, called The Rich, the Right, and the Facts uh, about, uh, about that transition. That you had, uh, if you look at, at it as a, as a, as a bar graph, the, the, the first post-war generation is this picket fence, uh, and the second generation is a stepladder with the, for the first uh, step of it being below ground. So uh, in terms of rates of change of income. So no, there's a, there's a total transition. Everything changes around 1980. Um, now, if you go a little bit further back, however, and I think this is also relevant, that middle class society, the one I grew up in, uh, the, uh, that, that period of sh broadly shared growth, um, that was, um, that's not the way America always was. Uh, America was a very unequal society in 1929, uh, and, but it's a quite equal society by 1947. And a uh, closer up look at the data says that that happened quite suddenly, happened really largely during World War II. Um, it's what uh, um, it is the, the Claudia Golden calls the Great Compression. Uh, so the middle class society that we had for a generation after World War II was created. It was created by the rise of unions and a favorable political environment, by the use of government power to equalize uh, wages, uh, by high taxes on top incomes. Uh, so it's actually telling you that, that, that the kind of society we have now is a choice. And I think that's the point. That the uh, uh, what we th what we're accustomed to, which is that growth is very much concentrated in the hands of a few people, is not a necessity, and in fact, it's it's not and it's not something that's beyond the reach of the political system. Uh, we 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 remade ourselves away from a plutocratic society once, and we could do it again. 
Great, Captain. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the question is, how does the race question fit in as an overlay to all of this? And when we talk about the prosperity society that was listed for 20 years, was that truly a prosperity society in terms of distribution? We can talk about capital accumulation during 200 years of slavery. There's a new debate about reparations, which is going to permeate a lot of the political discourse. How do you play that out in terms of an analysis and then obviously a political program? Yeah. The um, the truth is that despite uh, a lot of overt racism, uh, that post-war period of prosperity was uh, even even blacks uh, uh, um, you know, did uh, benefited from it. That doesn't mean that that there wasn't also a horrific amount of of, of raw racism in the society. But it it that that's. Uh, uh, there, there were benefits for just about everybody. Um, and the um, um, race played a crucial um, role in the political transition. If you ask why did, why did politics turn so suddenly rightwards in the United States, and the answer is basically it's uh, the delayed effects of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, uh, in in the, the New Deal coalition, sar sad to say, um, was a coalition between a, a pretty uh, uh, liberal, social, and racial as well uh, group in the North and, uh, and Southern segregationists who were willing to sign on to a bigger government as long as it didn't uh, uh, endanger white supremacy uh, because they, they were, the, at that point, the South was still quite poor. Uh, and so uh, what's happened now is the, the, the racial issue is the racial issue is critical to everything. The race is, race is why the United States uh, doesn't look like other advanced countries in terms of a social safety net. Race is why, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's central to, to everything. Um, and, but maybe, maybe we can transcend that. I don't, uh, that's, that's a, uh, uh, that's one of the big unanswered questions in, in American politics. Uh, actually, my, my s puzzle slightly is why would there aren't a significant number of politicians who are uh, willing to take a, a, a racist populist position, you know, uh, not faux populist like Trump, uh, you know, whose, whose economic agenda is pure orthodox Republican, uh, but actual. Uh, uh, some pe people say, why, where, where are the advocates of a heron folk welfare state um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, w welfare state for whites only? Uh, and it's, it's an interesting fact that there doesn't seem to be anybody willing to play that role. Uh, and uh, uh, if, if there does emerge somebody willing to play that role, that person is going to be very, very dangerous. Time for one more, maybe back somewhere. Yeah, I can't. Two more. Ben Iorio, student at the University of Michigan. Um, Dr. Krugman, you talked about uh, the response to the financial crisis and perhaps uh, not enough deficit spending as a response. Uh, my question is, um, are deficit spending and increased taxes on the rich tools that should be used in conjunction, or are they uh, should just one? Could you talk about their applications and their uses uh, together or alone? Okay, let me give you, I, I've been trying to figure out what, how, how should we pay for a progressive agenda? Put it that way. How, 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 suppose there's a bunch of things we should be doing. We should be clearly spending quite a lot more on, especially on, chi on children, uh, and we need to be spending on infrastructure, and there's a whole bunch of things, and there, we're talking significant amounts of money. Um, some of that, and I, I would say that basically anything that can be reasonably considered to be an investment in the future it's okay to finance with deficits. Real interest costs for the U.S. are very, very low. Uh, interest rate is below the, the growth rate of the economy. Their debt is just, debt is, a, I mean, if you've got people like Olivier Blanchard and Larry Summers saying that, you know, deficit fears have been vastly overblown, I think we are in a situation where we shouldn't be worrying much about deficits. However, uh, that doesn't mean that you can you know, completely blow it away. Um, and so, um, uh, pieces of that program that would require sustained spending and are really more about social justice than about, uh, uh, that are, uh, 
I mean, there is quite a lot of stuff that's both investment and social justice, but there's also a fair bit of stuff that's just social justice. And I would say that you want to pay for the social justice parts by higher taxes on the rich. So that, uh, so that the two do uh, go in conjunction. I would say that both some increase in or better targeted deficit spending, because we're doing a lot of deficit spending right now, but uh, it's, it, we're running deficits uh, to pay for stock buybacks. But the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, but, but a combination of deficit spending on investment and um, taxing the wealthy to pay for social programs is, is the way I would go. Erica, you get the last question. Hi, um, Erica Payne from the Patriotic Millionaires. Will you talk about the intersection of um, trade and corporate taxes and tax avoidance? It seems like we are in an endless game of whack-a-mole with a very inadequate hammer. And I want to understand what the whole what the whole picture needs to look like if you could design it. Okay. Um, the corporate tax thing is a um, uh, corporate tax avoidance, uh, you know, profit shifting to tax havens, is a is a is a significant uh, thing. Although it, um, it's uh, it it's not a hundred percent because if um, if the ability to to globalize where profits are reported was unlimited, then we wouldn't have seen a. Uh, a 31% decline in corporate tax receipts after the ta Trump tax cut, right? So obviously, corporate taxes were collecting a sig significant amount of money uh, despite all of that. Um, but the, to the extent that it, it is an issue, look, they're, they're really, it's a, it's a handful of small countries where this stuff is being, uh, where profits are realized. Uh, they, the, uh, uh, we really are talking, you know, Ireland, Luxembourg, uh, and then, uh, financial industry is is where the you know the British Virgin Islands that sort of thing. Um, um, the major economies have got plenty of leverage to force those tax havens to shut down. Uh, if we had a coordinated move on the part of the G7 to say this this must stop, um, it would it would not be at all hard to do it. So you, you just need an agreement. Uh, you need to have progressive governments in enough of the major economies. Actually, to, to a large extent, I think basically if, 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 uh, if the British uh, and, and ourselves, uh, we, I think the Germans and the French would go along, uh, were to uh, say we're gonna have a crackdown on, on the tax havens, that would do it. It's, uh, we were even starting to move a little bit in that direction. The OECD was, was taking some real action. So I, I don't think, it's, it's one of those problems that is not hard technically. It's, it's a political thing. If, if widespread tax avoidance through international tax havens persists, it's because interest groups within uh, the advanced countries want them to persist. And uh, the moment we decide that that's not gonna happen, it will stop happening. It's, uh, it, it just, uh, it, it's just an easy problem to solve uh, with the right leadership. If we're, if, we're, if we're about to have a world in which the two major financial centers are are led respectively by Donald Trump and Boris Johnson, then it's gonna be a little bit of a while before it happens, but it will happen eventually. Okay.